Good morning, everybody. Uh, week 21 of the ENM 2020 course. And this talk is about uncertainty in ecological niche modeling. And I would suggest to you, assert to you that this is probably the dimension of niche modeling that has seen the least attention and the most neglect, which is to say, this is a crucial part of presenting any scientific result, and yet people rarely do it. In fact, I'll give you a bit of a, an anecdote from the deep past. Um, long time ago when I was exploring this, this field and starting to get involved, um, I was using a, a genetic algorithm. It, was a, uh, it has nothing to do with genetics, but it's a, a machine learning approach, and, and we used to use it for uh, for fitting niche models. And it, it had some advantages. It was called GARP. Um, and those early GARP models were really interesting because they involved several um, random steps where there, were, there was subsampling of occurrence data and things like that. And so if you ran the same input data multiple times, you got multiple different outputs. And back then when I would submit papers using that tool, uh, pretty often the reviewers would say to me, um, I don't like that tool because it's, it doesn't give you a deterministic result. I thought about that quite a bit. And in the end, I thought, you know, give me an algorithm, it might be the perfect algorithm that does give me a deterministic result, which is to say, same input data, same output result. I think that the first thing that I would do would be to bootstrap the data going in so that I don't get a deterministic result because I want to know about how much variation there is in that output. And you know, I hate to say it, but now 20 years later, we have algorithms that produce deterministic results. And very frequently we do exactly that. We subsample, we resample our input data precisely to generate an understanding of the variation. And even though we do that, we don't often present it. So let, let's explore this idea of uh, uncertainty in, in ecological niche modeling and, and how we deal with it and how we measure it. Okay, so let's, let's talk about uncertainty in ecological niche modeling. I would say that a very central part of the science process is that of reporting characteristics. It could be measurements, it could be masses, it could be ecological niches, but characteristics of organisms. And when we do that reporting, we always re report both the central, ten the central tendency and the dispersion around that central tendency. So the measures of central tendency that you guys all know are mean or average, and median, things like that. The measures of dispersion, you also know them, standard deviation and standard error. Those are both parametric measures, so they depend on an assumption of normality. But then there are non-parametric measures like the range or the interquartile range or the interdecile range. Um, we have a bunch of, um, I have a bunch of uh, alternative measures, and they each have their, their advantages and disadvantages. Now, generally, when we do one of these studies, we're most interested in the prediction. You know, in the case of niche modeling, it's the map. So let's imagine I tell you mean annual temperature in a place is 20 degrees centigrade. I can deal with that. I like 20 degrees, but what if the variation through the year is from 
45 degrees average in the summer to negative 40 degrees in the winter. Maybe I can't deal with that. But if the variation is 24 in the summer down to 16 in the winter, I could be okay with that. So I think you want more than just the prediction and the measure of central tendency. I think you want some more detail. Uh, so let's, let's explore this more for niche modeling. Measures of dispersion are crucial in niche modeling. Um, we want to see that prediction, but we also have to understand the confidence with which we make that prediction. And confidence, whatever that is, depends on how strongly and how consistently a particular result is supported by the data. So in niche modeling, we have lots and lots of pixels. Or oftentimes there are, there are millions of pixels in a single niche model output. And each one of those is a prediction that may be well supported or it may not be very well supported by the data. And what's more, we have lots of sources of uncertainty. Basically everything we've talked about in this course up till now. Availability of occurrence data, biases in the input data, different model parameterizations, assumptions involved in model transfer, different environmental data sets, et cetera, et cetera. So here is a, an example that is a positive example. Um, and basically this is a study where the authors presented both the prediction and the associated uncertainty. And so this is about basking shark habitat suitability around the United Kingdom. And you can see land areas are shown in gray in both panels. But the left-hand panel shows predicted areas of habitat suitability. And the right-hand panel shows uh, the spatial coefficient of variation in the model prediction calculated across seven ensemble models. And so by looking at these two uh, summaries, we see a view of where is there a lot of certainty and where is there a lot of uncertainty in the prediction. This is just one example that I grabbed from the literature um, and just trying to get an idea of what, what are people doing over the past couple years as regards uncertainty. This is a pleasant one. These two, um, I'm not showing the, the title pages of, of these papers just because I'm not trying to call individual researchers out, but I, as far as I can see in, in these two studies and lots of other studies, all they're presenting is the suitability measure, and I don't see any parallel presentation of the uncertainty or the, the, the dispersion around that, um, that average or median value. And this is not good, but this is extremely common. So again, I'm not calling out any particular authors. What I'm doing is I'm saying that this is not a common enough practice in our area in niche modeling, and it should be. It should be universal, just the way if you present any characteristic of an organism, um, maybe arm length in a paper, you're gonna be expected to present the arm length and the standard deviation that characterizes the variation around that average value. So let's get some terminology here. Imagine we have some, some variable and we know the true value. And I've shown that as a yellow arrow here. Well, some ways of estimating or characterizing that characteristic may give us an answer that is off to one side from the true value. And that consistent departure from the truth is what we call bias. Okay, there's another concept which is related 
but different, and that is the idea of precision. And so as I measure that characteristic, I may see a fair amount of variation in my measurements. And notice that in this case, they're centered on the true value. So that's a imprecise value that is nonetheless not biased. So we have bias, which translates into error, and we have precision or lack of precision, which translates into variation. And both of those pairs of ideas feed into what we call uncertainty. And a really crucial point is that uncertainty can be low even when bias is strong. Okay, and that means that we have to manage these concepts separately. Now we're gonna come back to bias and error in a week when we talk about model evaluation, okay? For right now, we're just trying to get at this, this concept of, of uncertainty and particularly uncertainty that comes from, from variation. So we have some really simple approaches that are available to us and they can be pretty powerful. So as we always have, we can present the best model prediction, which is gonna be some sort of summary of the central tendency of replicate models. But we should also always present some measure of the dispersion of those replicates. A very easy way to do that is to present the range of values, pixel by pixel, across model replicates. And that's gonna be very, very useful in, in understanding um, what is the, the confidence with, it, with which we can interpret those results. And each GIS platform out there offers very simple ways to summarize multiple rasters. One can get uh, a combination of, of multiple rasters immediately as a range or a standard deviation. And that's, that's uh, there's, essentially there's no excuse for not doing this. It's, it's quite easy to do. Um, and that tells us when we look at the, the, uh, the range or the, the standard deviation or whatever the metric of dispersion, that tells us immediately what parts of our map are communicating predictions with high confidence versus with low confidence. So I'm gonna give you an example from a study that I did a few years ago with, with my doctoral student and uh, now professor in Egypt, uh, Abdallah Sami. Um, and essentially we were looking at the, the geographic uh, potential of the different phyloviruses, Ebola and Marburg viruses across Africa. And we had data that were, in some cases, relatively abundant, and in some cases, not. Uh, so for example, you can see um, Bundibugyo Ebola virus is known from two places. And Thai forest Ebola virus is known from two other places, one of them not at all certain. But you can see Ebola Zaire or Ebola Sudan and Marburg virus are somewhat well better uh, represented by points. These are the input data, but we were interested in the map of uh, where each of these species could potentially appear. And we were interested in how confident we were in those maps. So let's, let's explore a bit more. Here are the maps that we presented in that study. Uh, five species, Sudan, Zaire, Marburg, Bundibugyo, and Thai forest. And in each, for each species, you can see on the left a map of the central tendency, essentially the prediction. And on the right, you can see a map of uncertainty. This is just the range uh, of values across the different replicate models that we produced. And what I want you to notice is that 
sometimes we have high values of the prediction, which is to say a prediction of suitability, associated with low values of uncertainty. Okay, that's a, that's a prediction. Not only am I saying suitable, but I'm also saying suitable with pretty high confidence. But then I also want you to see that there are predictions that we get out where the area of highest suitability is also associated with the area of highest uncertainty. Uh-oh. Um, so this was an interesting exercise in how much do you believe the model results that you are getting out? And so one graphic that I've found to be very interesting is this one. This is a graphic pix pixel by pixel across the whole map of the suitability, essentially the central, central tendency, versus the uncertainty, the, the dispersion measure. Now, what I want you to notice is that some of these um, some of these species, like look at Bundabugyo, has predictions of high suitability, but only up here in a sector of high uncertainty. Other predictions, like for Sudan Ebola virus, notice that it makes concrete predictions of low suitability versus high suitability, and it does both of those with low uncertainty. So we can kind of pay attention to these two sectors as being where concrete predictions are made. And so the ideal signature of a model would not be some upward slanting uh, relationship, but rather it would be this kind of frown-shaped relationship that we see for, for Sudan Ebola virus. And this is actually a topic that we'll come back to uh, in a talk by Sara Mortara, uh, where we're going to talk about kind of alternative approaches to, to model evaluation. So anyhow, I, I actually strongly recommend either via comparing maps or via developing a graphic like this, but I strongly recommend looking at how uncertainty and suitability co-vary. It's a very interesting characteristic that comes out of these models. And then last, I wanna show you some more advanced tools for evaluating model uncertainty. Um, this is a, a paper which I'll pr put on the on the course page. Uh, it's in BioArchive. It was written by Marlon Cobos and Luis Osorio um, with, my, with me as well. Um, we initially submitted it for publication to a couple journals. And let's just say there were way too many opinions um, amongst the reviewers, and so it didn't get published. And I think we got tired, and so we just put it on BioArchive. So there it is. Um, but these are interesting tools for representing variability in niche model predictions. So some of these are very, very simple uh, depictions of model agreement. So for example, this is about um, future predictions for a tick species. and what, and this is actually a, a representation that was developed initially by Lindsay Campbell, who was also a doctoral student of mine. Um, and Marlon and Luis have, have implemented this so you get these, these representations out automatically. But essentially, going from present to future, areas can be stably unsuitable, which is to say, they're not suitable now, and they won't be suitable in the future. Areas can be stable and suitable, which is to say they're suitable now, and they'll be suitable in the future. 
or there could be areas that are, are gaining suitability or losing suitability. And so what Lindsay envisioned was comparing the present to the future using uh, binary maps. So these have been thresholded already. Um, one can ask how much model agreement is there in predicting future gain or future loss? And so notice that our gain measure goes from four, which I believe is all models saying, yes, this will be suitable in the future. That's this fringe and this fringe. And then going down to lower and lower confidence out to, for example, this fringe. So only one of the, uh, the GCMs, the, the general circulation models involved, only one of them predicts expansion of the range this far north but all four of them predict expansion this far north. So that's a very nice way of just getting at how much support is there for uh, a particular result. I should have shown you there's also a similar gradient in, in loss. This area here, very likely to be lost from the range, but this area, according, seeing less uh, confidence. So we need to think about sources of variation. In a present day model, we may have variation from, coming from different replicate uh, resampling, subsamplings of the occurrence data. We may have mul multiple algorithms. We may have multiple parameterizations, et cetera, et cetera. When we transfer those models to future conditions, it gets even more complex. Uh, we have different future climate models, general circulation models. We have different um, scenarios of future climate change. And so you can see that this already complicated set of lots of replicate models turns to even more. And so we need to find ways of, of summarizing this variation and um, and making it tangible and making it visible. So Marlon and Luis developed an R package uh, that includes these. It's, it's part of the KUENM package that, that Marlon will be talking about in a couple weeks. Uh, but it includes these different pieces. And um, I'll show you these the, the outputs of these. Uh, but essentially, these are these are just um, ways of summarizing your model results that will be useful in understanding uncertainty. And you get out this kind of panel of, of models or of, of visualizations of their models. First panel is, is the results under current conditions. And you can see the occurrence points, and a binary version of your prediction. You can see a continuous version of your prediction. And you can then see, in this case, the variance deriving from um, the different replicate runs of the model um, that, you, that you developed. Now, under current conditions, this may be uh, transferred worldwide. And so now you can see the same three, um, the same three panels, but globally. And if you had multiple models selected, we'll talk about this when we talk about KUENM, but if you had multiple models selected by the algorithm, then you would also have uh, variants coming from different parameter settings. I'll show you an example of that in a moment. Um, and then for the same example, you get the worldwide condition, worldwide transfer under future conditions. And so you can see the different measures of suitability, but now you can see variants coming from different model replicates, variants coming from 
different general circulation models and variants coming from different representative concentration pathways. And what I want you to see is that we can see clear geographic foci of some of the um, factors and not at all in others. Here's a second example that was presented in the, in the Cobos Osorio Peterson paper uh, for a, uh, an example in Cuba. And what I want you to see is here we did have multiple models selected. And so we have variants coming from the replicates, which you can see really doesn't have geographic foci. But we also have variants coming from different parameter settings, which has really clear highs and lows in, in the, the variants intra introduced. And those same models can be looked at under future conditions. Uh, here are the predictions. And again, we can see uh, what variance is coming from what factors and where is that variance concentrated spatially. And then a final function, which I really like and I'm intrigued with, is this uh, quantifying the importance of the different uh, factors. And so this is a, another paper that I'll put on the, on the course page um, where we, we were looking, we were using a, a hierarchical partitioning approach, which is essentially a, um, an exhaustive ex examination of all possible regression models to ask what is the effect, for example, of different GCMs or different RCPs or different model replicates or different parameters. And what I want you to see in this particular case is that parameters are absolutely dominant. But in other cases we've looked at, it may be any of the others. So this is a good way of, of asking questions about what factors are introducing significant uncertainty into my models? Okay, so I've shown you tools ranging from very simple to more complicated, but let's just sum up. First of all, niche models are not magic. They are not always correct. That's why we do model evaluations, and that's what we'll be talking about next week. But also, ENM's niche models are not evenly correct or incorrect across the whole region where they're, where they're applied. They can have areas that are very certain and areas that are very uncertain. So one very important thing to do is to present, consider, discuss, explore, evaluate the uncertainty in the model predictions. So what are the sources? of uncertainty, where spatially is the uncertainty concentrated, and what are the implications of that uncertainty for the results of the study. So that is a short presentation about a big topic, and yet it's a big topic that has been sorely and woefully neglected in the niche modeling world. Um, I am perpetually surprised at the number of new studies, not 10 years ago or 20 years ago, but new studies that don't take into account model uncertainty. Um, I encourage you all to build this into your, your work. And some of the measures of uncertainty are really simple. And you can do them with QGIS or, or ARC or any of the, the GIS platforms. And others are, are more complex, but they're built right into some of the platforms that we use to, to create the models. So um, don't neglect this. Just the way you would present a standard deviation for some measurement of some morphological characteristic, present that same uncertainty measure or some crucial and relevant uncertainty measure when you present your niche models. Hope this was helpful. Take care, everybody.